Welcome to Interface. Here, we continue our discussion with Professor Sheldon Pollock in what is a second part of an interview with him. In the first part of the interview, Professor Pollock identified a crisis in classical and Sanskrit studies in India and discussed at length the context and the reasons for the same. Here, we continue that discussion. Kind of mistrust of the past, especially of traditional discourses, seems to be uh, part of the entire modernity ethos where uh, things to do, you want to move beyond tradition, you want to create a new world uh, which is quintessentially modern in nature and which defines itself in terms of its contrast or opposition with the past. Right. I was wondering uh, how did the West actually deal with this? Mm. Uh, did did something of the of a similar kind happen, especially in connection with the modernity movements in the West, when it comes to uh, the knowledges of uh, Greek and Latin classical works? Uh, mm. Because is there a ray of hope uh, uh, or an analogy that can be drawn on that basis? It's a very interesting <coughs> question. Uh, uh, I wish we had several hours to to go into it. Uh, but there, there are kind of two questions here. The, the one I certainly don't want to lose f the, our focus on is uh, the problem of the past and our ability to address the past. That's, that, that's a question I want to make sure we return to. But the analogy with Europe is quite interesting. In the 17th century, uh, as many of the viewers will, who have some exposure to European history of the early modern period, there was a great battle mm. in Europe between the ancients and the moderns, mm. the quarrel of the ancients and the moderns. Uh, and the, that is to say, those who supported the classical study model, who believed that all knowledge was contained in the past, and that the, the modern intellectual could never achieve anything remotely as successful as the Greeks and the Romans. These were the les anciennes, the adherents of the ancient paksha, you might say, uh, were defeated by the moderns. They were actually, I mean, it was a long, drawn-out battle of the books in England, Swift's famous battle of the books, but in France, where the issue was engaged most palpably, uh, it was the moderns who won. So in a sense, you could say Europe, Europe uh, after the great moment of the Renaissance, where the classics returned with a kind of kind of the return of the repressed, if you will, came back with a vengeance in 1400. For the next 250 years, the classics held kind of hegemonic position. And it was the moderns who, uh, who sought to uh, arrest that development. And of course, you know, it was, it was partly, you know, there, the idea that there's a relation between classical and class mm. is, not a, is not a fanciful one. I mean, there's a sense in which, in the European tradition, the classical was in fact the elite. Mm. And with the rising of the, the rise of bourgeoisie and the sort of a middle class, a middle class culture, a middle class epic known as the novel, mm. Uh, which sought to displace the old classical epic. So the, the story in Europe is really quite interesting and complicated. Uh, did it affect classical studies? Well, I think it affected cl classical knowledge more broadly across the social sphere. But in universities, uh, classical studies maintained their position of strength and in fact increased it into the 19th in early 20th century. But that's, that's very interesting because what you're pointing out here is a kind of rupture of tradition. Yes. But there, despite uh, the, the seeming battle of books or the, the seeming conflict between the ancients and the moderns, uh, the academic or scholarly tradition continued not just unabated but probably strengthening itself. Yes. Which is uh, almost the opposite of what seems to be happening here. Yes. It's very difficult to to think analogically across historical true, period, uh, across historical spheres, and but as you make a very interesting, um, it's a very interesting insight to uh, to measure the South Asia experience, the Indian. Although when I use the word South Asia, I mean I mean to to, to really describe mm. 
a, a very large space in which similar things, because Persian in Pakistan is very hardly different from what's going on mm. in, South, in, in mm. India. So I like to speak in terms of South Asia. Uh, I mean, I guess uh, you, you know, begin to think, you begin to wonder what the, what, what the role of colonialism in all mm. of this may have <clears throat> been. Uh, I should. I just want to add that there was a moment of a, of a, of, a, of a battle of the ancients and the moderns in India in the 17th century too. There was a group of intellectuals called the Navyas. Mm. I've written about this. A very interesting, slightly obscure history about which we are slowly learning something. But there was a moment of attempted renewal in the 17th century, which might have had its own historical development if colonialism had not intervened and changed the rules mm. of the game. But here's the paradox. Here's the paradox. Classical studies, the understanding of India's past, the understanding of the beauty of Indian literature over a 2,000 year period. I mean, what culture has as continuous and un unbroken a multilingual literary tradition as South Asia? No, there's no other world like it. It's absolutely unique and absolutely an astonishing monument to human consciousness. And in the, in the 18th and 19th, and indeed, the first half of the 20th century, I'm not saying colonialism created the conditions of possibility for this. this was, these were traditions that were very strong when colonialism came, mm -hmm. the, study of the study of historical languages and across the board. I mean, there were, there, were, there were traditional intellectuals of great, of majestic intelligence and accomplishment in the 17th and 18th century. And I think many of these, many of these, of the descendants of these extraordinary intellectuals were able to cult cultivate their, their specialties up until really the middle of the 20th century. Mm. So then you ask yourself, what was it about independence that would, if something happened in, from 1947 onward uh, that has made it so difficult for uh, uh, forms of knowledge to perpetuate themselves into the present. This is a conundrum to me. At the moment when India seizes its destiny, it loses itself mm. in so, to some degree. Now, I, I, it's not a blanket condemnation. I mean, modern India, contemporary India, is an extraordinarily dynamic, fascinating, amazing place. Uh, the only plea I want to make is that there are, and this gets back to the historical, the mm. question of history, mm. Mm. which you, you stated so powerfully. Uh, was there a moment where the past has become, has there been a moment where the past beca has become a burden? Mm. Where there's a sort of ethics of forgetting. I remember in 1992, around the Ayodhya tragedy, when good colleagues of mine said, you know, in fact, I wrote an article, and I said, uh, it's not those who forget the past who uh, repeat it, it's those who remember the past mm -hmm. who repeat it. And that the Mustard Mundir problem was, it, was, was historical memory gone berserk, mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. So your colleagues say, you know, maybe the ethics of forgetting in some Nietzschean sense of mm -hmm. just forgetting the past is the solution to the future. And I think we've seen in the last, and again, I speak as a, as a friend and admirer of India's, but as an outsider, just looking, looking at India from the outside, I've seen that the past is not going to go away, that there will be, that the anti-historians, the, anti, the enemies of history, who know nothing about the historical languages, who know, have no deep knowledge of classical, studies. It's the enemies of the anti-historians who have seized, who have seized history. And I, I think a critical, you know, a, classes, a classical studies that's critical, that's self-aware, that's reflexive, that understands the critique from the subaltern, the legitimate critique from below, uh, and that realizes that the neutralization, the neutralization of the toxins of culture comes about through knowing mm. that culture instead of mm. ignoring the culture. Mm. That overmastering, mastering and overmastering the past is the way to transcend the past rather than 
believing you couldn't ignore it. A critical engagement with the past. Precisely, and that I think is what is necessary, is self-aware, theoretically informed, but not doctrinaire, mm -hmm. but theoretically self-aware approach to the past that is philologically deep, mm. but open, seriously open to self-criticism, to political criticism. I mean, I, you know, it was the Didi Kosambi's 100th birthday anniversary a few years ago, and I was very honored to be asked to write, to, to write a piece on DDK uh, um, and his, his interest in Sanskrit. I mean, here's a great member of the Communist Party who's a um, very serious intellectual who was deeply committed to understanding the classical past. And one of the things that I realized in writing about DDK, not just, I mean, I, he was one of the heroes of my youth, but, and I realized that some of that hero worship might have been misplaced. <laughs> it will happen to me 30 years from now, too. But one of the things I realized thinking through uh, DDK's life and works and uh, accomplishments and critical approach to the past and deeply theoretically astute approach to the past and his deep textual knowledge of the past is not just what a marvelous scholar he was, but how there are no, there are no Didi Kosambis today. Mm. Mm. There is not, you cannot think of a single person who embodies both the deep command of, uh, uh, of, the, of the resources of the past and also a, a kind of theoretical, theoretically self-aware approach to the past. So we have the brain-dead philology today, mm -hmm. which is simply the reproduction of, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just count the manuscripts or, mm. I mean, you know, the, the kind of, you know, somebody once said of... Kind of mechanical kind of work. Which yeah, is, yeah. yeah, exactly. Mechanical and unimaginative and unself-aware. Or the, the, you know, the know-nothing mm. anti-enemies of history who, have, who, who are increasingly coming to the center of the public, public sphere, who have attempted to capture some of the intellectual energies of the past. Mm, a kind of celebratory mode which is usually there. Exactly, yeah. a celebration, indige indigenous celebration. Uh, that, in my view, is not what a critical classicism is about. What, obviously, you know, any present, uh, you yourself have used uh, the term presentism, mm. which seems to be ruling the roost in many academic discourses these days. Obviously, that is no recipe for the future. That is no, uh, you know, resort for the future in that sense. What would you suggest uh, would be a possible solution for this problem? Uh, but I, I know this is this is not a fair question. No, no, it's fair. <clears throat> I mean, if you say, if you have somebody coming around and saying this, the, 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 the X is terrible, Y is terrible, Z is terrible, then the question you should ask them, well, what are you going to do about it? It's an entirely legitimate question. Um, before I get to that, let me just say you're absolutely right. That our, this question of presentism. I gave a I gave an, an address to the um, American Comparative Literature Association not too long ago, and I did a little study of American and European comparative literature. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I came up with a statistic, mm -hmm. and my statistic is that 95 percent of comparative literature is concerned with 2% of historical human literary experience. Mm. I, I, do, I, I have a statistical base upon which <laughs> I've made this invert. Uh, uh, so in the, in, in the many spheres, it's not just, it's, it's all over the, as you rightly pointed out, this problem of the, ki the kind of the shallow, the, the hollowing out of our historical understanding, the shallow, I mean, there's a, there was a very great sociologist um, whose name is now escaping me, uh, who wrote a book on the civilized, uh, uh, the, um, what was his name, the civilized, the civil... Um, Bourgeois? No, he was, a, he, was a, he was a German scholar who, who wrote a book on court culture and 
very interesting scholar. But he's, mm. he spoke of, he was actually a historical sociology, a sociologist, and he spoke about the retreat of sociology into the present. Mm. It's, so you're absolutely right, it's, it's, it's ubiquitous. Uh, the question is, I, and I haven't forgotten your main question about um, what is to be done, uh, but I, you know, I, I, I think that there are, there, there, are, there are a number of reasons to, to think seriously about the past, not just to recover it from the anti-historians, but, uh, but as I said the other day, I think there are resources for living in the past. There's beauty in the past. There is a kind of discipline that we give our children when we encourage them to learn a very different language. As Gadamer said, human being is being in language. Mm. And if you confront a radically different language, you know your own language even better. So there are lots of reasons to do this. The question finally is how should we proceed? And for this, I mean, I, I think, I think friends and colleagues who care about these issues in South Asia need to begin a serious collective and I would say loud conversation about what is to be done. I, far be it from me to prescribe. Should the state be involved? It has its pluses and minuses, as we said the other day. When India decides to do something serious about a serious problem, it can do it as well as any, any country in the world. You want to have science? Produce an IIS. And I think I think a lot of those institutions are very, very good. Um, could an Indian Institute for Classical Studies solve the problem? I, possibly, if it's done properly. We're not, you know, we're not talking about a mass movement. Mm -hmm. We do not need tens of thousands of, hundreds of thousands of competent scholars. What we need is a dedicated institute or set of institutes that will cultivate these studies and make them available to anyone who wants to mm -hmm. learn. So there may be a role for the state. Is there a role for the private sector? I think undoubtedly there is. Uh, if I can mention this briefly, uh, Narayana Murthy and family from Infosys, they're a marvelous group of people who uh, fully understand mm -hmm. the kinds of issues that I have been speaking about these last, this last half hour. And they decided to do something about it. They said, let's have a series of books published both in America and in India from all the regional traditions of classical India, Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, Kannada, Hindi, Bangla, Oriya, Sanskrit, Persian. And let's have a, let's have a library where we would have translation and text so that even the general reader it's like a bilingual edition. It's like it's a bilingual edition. <clears throat> mm. And we're going to do this. We're going to launch it in 2013. And if all goes well, within 100 years, there will be 500 books in this library from Assamese to Urdu for people of India and around the world to understand what might have been lost mm. if there were not such a library. So there is, there is a role for enlightened private citizens uh, to play in this. Again, we're not talking about massive mobilization of resources. It's not like finding the cure for cancer or stopping global warming. Uh, those are, you know, Foucault once made the distinction between the universal intellectual and the specific, the specific intellectual. And the universal intellectual is the is the, is the ultimate arbiter of truth and justice and addresses the great questions of the big, the big questions. And then the specific intellectual is a person like me who addresses specific problems at specific sectors at specific time and place. Now, I think that these two modes of intellectual engagement are not opposite, in fact. I think they're complementary, and I think there's actually a, a sort of fractal relationship between the object of the specific intellectual and the object of the universe, a sort of fractal relationship where a sort of a part for the whole, where the part embodies all the contradictions and possibilities of the whole. And I think the recovery of classical studies in India uh, is in its own way 
like the problem of stopping global warming. It, not to be megalomaniac about this, but there's, there's a sense in which learning what it means to be a human being and what it has meant over centuries to be a human being, what 3,000 years of some of the most sophisticated consciousness the world has ever seen can tell us is about to be lost. And that, I think, is what the specific intellectual wants to see addressed. That was a grim reminder from Professor Pollock about the state of classical studies in India today. If there is one lesson to be taken home from this interface, it is that unless urgent steps are taken to arrest this residence, classical studies will be non-existent in India before long. Hopefully, something will be done before everything is lost. Thank you.